Welcome everybody. Welcome again to a new episode of Future Bytes. We are on uh, in Penn Plaza, New York City, at the Hackensack Meridian Health Stage 17 in the Cumulus Media Studio. Uh, wonderful setup, and today we have uh, fantastic guests. Um, Today's episode is about something that I care a lot and something that drives me crazy when I deal with my kids, which is uh, <laughs> leftovers and how to make sure that we work hard to reduce the, the waste, the food waste uh, that, that we have. And as far as I'm concerned, uh, there is a little bit of an issue. I would like to, obviously, that's why we're here for. I would like to introduce you and then I'll give you my two cents and then after that, it's just all you and you tell me you know, what you think, where we're going, what's happening and how we can all uh, be helpful. So, ladies first, Kiana Miki. Kiana Miki is from, uh, um, uh, you see, the director of Just Food. Yes. Can you tell me about your company, really yeah. quick? Thank you, yeah. Um, we are um, an equity-centered food justice nonprofit. Okay. Our office is based in uh, New York City in Midtown. However, our partners are hyper-local from the five boroughs of New York City all the way um, to for 250 miles. So a day's trip from a farm. Damn. How long has it, has it been in operation? Yeah. So Just Food has been around in our region for 23 years. Wow. Um, and I've been the executive director for the past year. Okay. How's it going? Good? Good. <laughs> yeah. Lots of work. Uh, Lots I can imagine. Of work. I can imagine. <laughs> uh, my other guest is uh, Robert Lee, CEO of Rescue Leftover Cuisine. Welcome. And uh, thank you so much for being here. Yeah, of course. Um, and, you know, just to introduce, introduce myself, um, we, uh, I'm a CEO and co-founder of Rescue and Leftover Cuisine, which is a nonprofit organization that brings leftover food to homeless shelters. We work with food businesses like restaurants, catering companies, and we bring whatever excess food they have to homeless shelters, soup kitchens, and food pantries through a web application called Toto and Ruby on Rails that allows for volunteers to basically just sign up online and rescue food on their own. So that is absolutely crazy. All right, so this is, uh, this is where I come from. I grew up in a very small town on the hills out of Florence. Um, it was a farm just because grandpa had the property, but I didn't grow up as a farmer. I, I, I am a fake farmer, meaning like <laughs> <laughs> I grew up in the fields, but you know, yes, I, it was more about the, the, the connection that I have with the land. Um, something used to happen, and, and it's still buzzing my head every time I sit for a meal. When I was uh, at the table with my mother, at the end of the meal, she would point the finger to your plate and say, there are 25 cents of food on your plate. Mm -hmm. you, either you finish it or you save it for later. Our house always ran on leftovers. My house still runs on leftovers. For us, as a generation, 30 years ago when I was living with my parents, it was uh, mandatory. There were absolutely no discussions. These days, especially, and, and it's sad to say living in America where it's a little different, where we consume a little too yeah. much of everything, Talking to kids and explaining kids what are the downfall or a certain kind of yeah. er erratic behavior or mm -hmm. not really putting your thought into, you know, right. the shopping. I give you an example. Yesterday, uh, my, you know, finally school is over. My daughter was home and she's like, can I order a sandwich and can I have uh, food delivered to the house? I'm like, well, we did the groceries yesterday. The mm -hmm. fridge is full. I'm happy that you like ordering food, but today there's just, she skipped lunch. I tried mm -hmm. to force her to open the mm -hmm. fridge and get whatever that was fresh. I'm like, look, we had steak last night and we have leftovers. There's fresh food, there's vegetables. Right. You're not starving today. But between the money that I spent putting the food in the fridge mm -hmm. and that I would lose if it doesn't get eaten right. and the money that you're asking me to spend to eat something that is possibly less fresh than what I am offering, yeah. like, there's an issue here. So no, today, no. And she gave me shade because of it. <laughs> uh, but I think it's part of uh, the, uh, let's say, uh, education issue. Mm -hmm. It's something that we have to battle. Uh, so again, I I'll keep on going to the lady just because we have a lady on the oh. panel. Um, <laughs> yeah. What is, uh, wha what is uh, to you, Kiana, the, the first uh, step or wha what is the first issue that you tackle when you approach the subject and how do you build awareness? No, I think that's a really good point. I think in America, we kind of grow up with this ongoing quest and thirst for convenience, and we'll forget about cost, we'll forget about value, quality, integrity, because we think everything needs to be super convenient. You know, right way, my way, you know. Box pre-washed salad yeah. that goes bad in two days, you know, for super example. Super packaged yeah. orange, and it has to look perfect. We've also become really conditioned to expect our food to look and be perfect. 
it, the tomato has to be the perfectly round red tomato and it has to look like, you know, just off a supermarket fresh. And when you tell people that there is beauty and quality in fruit and vegetables that don't always look pretty, that's um, an aesthetic thing that I think is an education piece. And for us at Just Food, um, a lot of our work comes in nutrition and community food education, mm -hmm. and we also offer training, um, advocacy training, as well as community chef training, basic culinary skills like knife skills training. And one thing um, we also do, one of our part, a big network that we've had and we help establish mm -hmm. in the city is CSAs and community supported agriculture. Okay. And when I explain to folks and help um, folks understand in the community why they should have a direct relationship with a farmer, and what does that bring? It's not going to just bring you food. It's not going to just bring you vegetables. It's also an opportunity to be educated. Oh, absolutely. And so for us, it's thinking about food waste before it's waste, um, making sure food has a home, and being a part of a model that you're helping a farmer pay in advance for seeds and growing food that will come to your home. And if that food doesn't make it to your home, um, there's another partner behind that will be able to get it, like to food pantry, soup kitchens, um, and also preparing food, kind of like what you were saying. We kind of forget that it doesn't take that long to make a very quick meal. No, it doesn't. And if you know um, just n simple knife skills and just you're creative about what you're cooking, you can make a very quick, healthful meal better than you can so get. So sometimes it's a matter of convenience, but convenience uh, cannot necessarily go against health or against yeah. your, your, your well-being. Let me, let me move mm -hmm. to Robert really quick, uh, or, or not too quick. <laughs> 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 so one of the things when I arrived in the US, I, was, uh, I fell in love with Flores and I ended up in Los Angeles. So I moved from the mom and pop corner shop with the old lady where you can buy like the one apple because if mm -hmm. you live by yourself, there's no need to get the big box, right. there's no need to go. And all of a sudden I am in the land of the 24 hour 24-7 market where everything is polished and shined and right. it's almost like a fashion show. Yeah. Uh, the, the downfall of that is that you realize fairly soon if you pay attention that you're buying too much because all of a sudden it's almost like that impulse shopping. You're driven by beauty. You're driven, first of all, never go to the supermarket when you're hungry or when you have the munchies. That just does not happen. Yeah. <laughs> you, you go to the supermarket with something in your head. Right. I tell my wife with coffee in the morning, what do you want to have for dinner? She's like, really? <laughs> like, and what? I'm like, well, to a degree, yes, because yeah. the more thought you put into it, especially when it becomes uh, your way of thinking, mm -hmm. that is a cycle that can become really helpful and beneficial to you know, conservation and, and use of resources. In the work that you do, where do you see your intervention being, you know, making the difference? Yeah, I mean, uh, the food waste issue is such a huge, huge problem. I think it's... Um, it's so mind-blowing to me because just thinking about the fact that 40% of the food that we produce in this country is wasted is, is in and of itself a huge number. Um, but then also just thinking about the fact that if we just rescue 30% of that and bring it to people who are food insecure, you can literally eliminate food insecurity. That, that kind of blows my mind and bothers me every day. Uh, and that's why we do the work that we do, which is take that excess food and, and distribute it to the people who need it. It really would seem a no-brainer, right? Yeah. Like, we have a surplus, <laughs> which is not a surplus because there are people in need. So, right. by definition, Literally that's not a surplus. food to, to feed everyone. So, so why don't we? <laughs> right. so and wh where do you see that happening? What, what are the main reasons why you yeah, see that I mean happening? There's, there's a lot of complex different issues. I mean, the, the food waste is happening on the entire supply chain, right? From the production level, from the farm level, to uh, the wholesale level, on the ugly fruits and vegetables. Uh, to the grocery level where we don't, um, as consumers, even choose the, you know, <laughs> the, the ugly ones. Uh, mm -hmm. And then on the you know, retail level, when, when we have uh, produced food and then we don't sell it, so we throw it out and make more the next day. Um, and for us, uh, as an organization, we basically target that last end where we work with the retailers uh, to take that excess food that's already been prepared, um, that would have gone to customers, but because they're closing, they have to throw it out. And essentially, we take that and bring it to the people who need it at Homeless Outdoor Soup Kitchen. Soup kitchen. And you mentioned that you're working, you're doing this also with an application, with a, is that a web-based application? Some technology. So that, that, is, uh, that, I, th that is what gets me incredibly excited because we're talking about problems that are really mm -hmm. like grounded and yeah. rooted and, yeah. and yeah. you know, this problems. is really dirt under your nails. Yeah. Right. But using technology to, to solve the problem is really what, what we're trying to do. The 
th that's the other thing. Like, you know, the, 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 the premise of this show is the kitchen of the future. <laughs> it's not going to be any future if you don't act on the issues that are presented in front of right. you at this given moment. So it is wonderful to talk about smart appliances and, and, and applications. How do they benefit you? Like, I love the idea, mm -hmm. not even that much, but I like the idea of a refrigerator that can talk back at you. <laughs> is that solving an issue for me? Not really, no, because yeah. the moment that it falls off the Wi-Fi, it's going to be another problem that I have. Exactly. But something like this. So t t explain about the app. Is it something that everybody can use, right? Yeah. So okay. Um, pretty much anyone can go onto a website, electricalrefugee.org, uh, and basically see a calendar uh, where we have uh, almost 50 events per day, and people can sign up online. Um, there's a map view if you want to see kind of what locations are around your area. And you can actually just sign up, get an automated email of where you're going to go and who you're going to meet. Um, and then do the pickup together. Is and there a difference between privates or restaurants or supermarkets, or is it just like anybody can apply? Well, so food donors can apply as well on our website, and there's a separate section where you can just fill out your information and submit information on what type of excess food you have mm -hmm. and that kind of mm -hmm. thing. Um, and then our team basically kind of arranges the relationship um, as needed. Um, so honestly, any type of uh, food donor can apply and, and work with us. Uh, mm -hmm. We specifically target a little bit of smaller poundage uh, because we don't own any trucks, right. uh, and so we, you know, work with the food bank and, and City Harvest and large organizations that can actually accommodate that kind of food. But we typically focus on the smaller amounts that are not being serviced by large organizations. Right. So a any any legal issues associated yeah, with donating really food, which is you know yeah. restaurants yeah. usually have the, the the biggest you know yeah. restaurants uh, like France for instance for the first yeah. time yeah. allowed uh, now all supermarkets right. to you know give it to kids. I think we all need to do that. When I had a restaurant, I was told that you really cannot send it because yeah. uh, you know right. this is also I'm so sorry but th this yeah. is also America like the land I'm gonna <laughs> sue you like really like yeah, in Italy will tell you yeah. you got food for free <laughs> and, and you got yeah. like uh, stomach bug <laughs> maybe next time you want but there is a uh, why adding a bigger problem or the idea of a problem when yeah. you're trying to solve right. some something else right. Right. Um, yeah. about about your app I, is it growing is it just New York based or there's multiple cities so that are yeah. so we're growing and, and Thanks for asking. I mean, we're in 16 cities now, and we're looking to grow even further. Um, we basically just need more food donor partners, more volunteers to sign up online. So mm -hmm. um, it's just all about kind of engaging the community to Wonderful. solve the problem together. Well, by the time that the episode goes out and gets edited, all the information you know, will be there for yeah. our viewers and our users to be able to download the app. And I'll, I'll make sure that I do it today before, <laughs> before we leave. Um, Kiana, let, let me ask you about education. When you, when mm -hmm. you talk to people, yeah. um, what is uh, the, um, your ideal audience? Is that a mother? Is that a child? Like, it, th the way that I feel mm -hmm. is that these days, especially with my kids, it's really not as much as asking my wife's help. Mm -hmm. It's really about being able to have a conversation with a child and making sure that they understand. So, you know, yeah. what is your target and what is the response and what could be done better, obviously? Sure. Um, you know, our lens at Just Food, again, bringing like a racial, economic, and social um, justice lens to the work. It really means like for us, like meeting our partners where they're at. So I guess I personally being a mom think that there's a big potential in um, youth and in, in young people and educating them just as you would about, you know, languages and, and, um, and math, that these are these basic elements to our, our food and having a connection to land and hunger and nutrition and what we can do differently and also recycle. You know, it's funny, so just to interrupt. Yeah. I, I remember when I was a kid and uh, my grandmother always told me that when she went to school, they had house economy classes. Yeah. It was a targeting female because obviously it was very, you know, it wasn't racial profiling, but those were the years where the man was right. out working and the wife was, was at home. But when women went to school, they were, I wouldn't say taught, but educated about how the house economy works, yeah. you know, how you manage your money, how you manage your food. Mm -hmm. And then do you think that is something that is lacking that we should yeah. go back to? I mean, I, per I definitely do. I think there's skills. And again, like when you take the gender lens off of it, there's so many things that we are missing from our ancestors that were kept them resilient. They, they kept seeds, 
they knew how to prepare food, they knew how to keep it longer, they knew how to preserve it. Things that we're trying now to go back to, they already did and we're going across countries doing it and keeping us whole and keeping our families whole. Well, I'm, I'm trying to teach my youngest daughter that the Tupperwares in the house are for the food and not for her slime projects. Oh, right. <laughs> so no, it's <laughs> yeah. so true. <laughs> yeah. She but doesn't <laughs> understand. It's like, no, that's for food, honey. Yeah. yeah. And you know, for, for us, our, our work, we really want people to not just meet them where they're at, but also make the most, um, the people who are the most marginalized be the most heard. So how do we amplify that work in stories? And something when I was thinking about this podcast and in and, and our conversation, it's also when you think about food in, its, in itself, like say a sweet potato, mm -hmm. you know, we kind of are used to having sweet potatoes and cooked a certain way and depending on your culture, it's prepared. Like for me, sweet potato pie, um, you know, now, you know, fried sweet potato, french fries when you go like out to like a bar or something. But there are actually you know, other cultures um, that use other elements of that sweet potato, like the sweet potato leaves. Yeah. And like I know with, um, I've heard from farmers and communities that Caribbean folks like tend to use that. And I, have, I know a farmer who was um, uh, harvesting sweet potatoes and was cutting the leaves and about to compost them. So that's like great. But um, neighbors walk by and were like, what are you doing? We use those leaves, I want those leaves. And she had never, even though she's a farmer, right. thought that you could use those vegetables in that way. And I, I think for it us it too, it's It happened the same piece. thing to me. I was training in, in a restaurant in Los Angeles trying to learn about the business right before I got my TV show. And I was put in the corner to do fava beans, to clean them up. I mm -hmm. shot like five cases in the morning while I was looking at the kitchen. Yeah. By the time that I was done, I went to the chef and I'm like, I'm done, where do you want me to toss this? And he was like, toss what? Like you need to now go back to the peels, eliminate the tip and the end, mm -hmm. and redo them because we're gonna blend them, we're gonna make broth, we're gonna make sofritos, like nothing goes to waste. Exactly. And, and this actually, I'll bring it back to you, Rob. Where do you see the first uh, important moment in raising awareness? Uh, you know, obviously, yes, kids, but if we're talking about general people, people at home, people mm -hmm. that have a restaurant, people that might be either younger or, or older, that the, the the thought that we should keep in mind, what would be the best way to strategize in order to limit the food waste, uh, let's say starting at home, because that's really. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, I think understanding the, the scale of the problem and, and understanding the legalities that exist, I think kind of going back to um, some of the, the points raised earlier, I think there are a lot of people that think, you know, donating food is illegal. And, you know, there's actually a, a federal law that applies in all 50 states, of course. Um, called the Bill Anderson Good Samaritan Act of 1996 that covers um, you know, food donors from legal liability from the case of you know, extreme carelessness and not adhering to food safety standards. But um, I think if people understand that you know, the it's okay to donate food <laughs> and, right. mm -hmm. and to also understand the value of food, uh, I think people will start to really understand. Like ultimately, we're not talking about a lack of generosity because the food is right. going in the garbage. Right. <laughs> so, you know, yeah. putting it into a box or, or having it picked up or delivered, it's really, yeah. as, as a mechanical act, not mm -hmm. different than tossing it into right. the bin. Right. It's just a thought exactly. that's thought. important. And the thought yeah. is not there just yeah. yet. Yeah. Why, why do you see that? Why do you think the thought is not there? In my opinion, I think it goes yeah. back to the convenience piece. Everyone yeah. just thinks of food as something to do and cross off the list and just keep going. Uh, and they don't even think about where the food is going to and right. where it's coming from. Uh, the fact that, you know, pr to produce all this food, we're using half the U.S. land, 80% of the U.S. fresh water, 10% mm -hmm. of the U.S. energy budget, and then we're wasting 40% of all of that is a huge natural resource constraint. Um, but then people are not thinking about that. People are just right. thinking, I'm just going to eat and, and whatever, I have to go, I'm busy. Right. Um, and they're not thinking about the fact that the, f the excess food is also going to landfills. They're not thinking about the fact that animals are being slaughtered for no reason. Uh, they're not thinking about all the different aspects that right. go into food. Yeah. They might think, oh, it's going to be recycled and become compost. Right. So, you know, I don't necessarily right. feel guilty because, you know, earth to the earth, ashes to ashes. Yeah. But it's not as a simple, right? It's not simple. And I think we, there's gaps in the education. So there, I feel like there's times when people don't really see the inherent pieces around convenience, but heard of recycling or they heard of right. composting. Different aspects. They of yeah, yeah, but not like the full right. piece right. where... It's like I can do. I can support um, food. You know, food grown by folks that are really thinking about the land and the usage. Absolutely. I can yeah. e eat it better, consume it better, use it better, preserve it, and then there's less waste from my part. So there's 
that my role. And even if they're at a, at a larger scale, there is still extra. There are other people who still need that. Absolutely. Yeah, people just don't connect the dots. And even things yeah. about, you know, I know we're talking about food waste, but when you, you I see a lot of greenwashing in terms of like um, compostables. Yeah. And so people will think you, it's, it's easy to fall prey to the marketing. It, it, yeah. Uh, and, and the, the marketing is like there to make you with. feel less guilty exactly. about the bullshit that you yeah. do. Instead of just weird, thinking, right? like, connecting the dots and yeah. saying, like, wait, like you said, like, if I don't put this somewhere else or we're not really recycling it, it's not going to really decompose. Yeah. Or these compostables that they told me are recyclable, I don't really understand it needs, like, a whole other chain of that, systems that, that are That drives me insane that because, like, okay, so, you know, you, you're using technology, you're using an application yeah. to, to, you know, spread the yeah. word and, and, and actually build a community that is uh, mm -hmm. bound by the same values. Yeah. So that there is that recognition of that issue and everybody's on it to do right. that. On the other side, you know, I've done food TV for a bunch of years and I've seen uh, the, the pinnacle of it and how it moved from TV to digital media and, and my Facebook feeds, my social media feeds are not necessarily invaded, but I see a gigantic discrepancy between what I consider real food right. and why do I need to know and why are you doing that X store makes the 20 gallon cup of ice cream. Like <laughs> <laughs> that to me is extremely yeah. American in, in, in a yeah. sense that it's not necessarily yeah. positive. Just because yeah. you can, More that doesn't easier. mean that you should. <laughs> exactly. and, and it's not just about the ultimately, yes, your thought is that if I don't finish it, this ice cream is gonna go in the garbage. Think about the footprint, right. not just the ingredients, the dairy where it comes from, all right. the different ingredients, the work that has been put behind the counter yeah. to assemble the damn two gallon ice cream that, mm -hmm. it's not ice cream <laughs> by, the, by right, definition. Right. <laughs> so, uh, but okay, so that to me though is a city problem. Mm -hmm. Do you differentiate or do you see difference between, uh, let's, I don't wanna call it necessarily rural, but behavior out of the city or behavior that happens in a place like Manhattan? Like, I, I live in, in Brooklyn, and gentrification has pushed out the small stores. So going out to, to buy the two apples, it's possible for me because there's still a couple of places, but the disadvantaged families are the ones that pay the most price. So not only you have the food scarcity, but you don't even have the leftovers, and when you do the leftovers, you are not plugged into a cycle. So it looks like, you know, right. th there is also this discrepancy, this diversity between, you know, genders and affluent versus less affluent. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's something that we're, we try to like come full force and address um, with our work. It's, it's, it's connecting not just people directly to food so they know where the food is coming from, but it's also giving folks a chance either through CSA or being market managers or connecting businesses, small businesses that are using apples or you know onions and, and other whole items, whole food items to make um, say sofrito or hot sauce. We are trying to find ways to um, address the rate. These are purposeful racial and economic disparities in our communities that keep healthy food from other folks. And what we're trying to do is use models and business practices that not only support people to come into communities, but they make it viable, viable for the community members to purchase it. Um, finding ways maybe through SNAP or EBT or right. Thought Help Bucks to make it yeah, more SNAP affordable. SNAP took a hit this week. Oh yeah, mm. oh, it's gonna continue to take a hit. And you know, th again, like those are the kind of things that when you see it, like I was at a, farm, a CSA pickup and the farmer had to pay out of pocket to get SNAP equipment. And even that SNAP equipment wasn't the most advanced SNAP equipment. So you know, when we talk about tech, there's so, it, we shouldn't be scared of tech. There's no. definitely ways that tech can help connect us to food and connect other folks that wouldn't get the food otherwise. Um, and we're creating policies or policies are getting created that people aren't even aware of to really know how to advocate for better yeah. and to make sure that it's more equitable for folks. Um, and that's really kind of our work across the spectrum is how do we galvanize individuals on the individual community and systemic level yeah. um, to make those changes so everyone has access to that food, but at the same time that farmer is able to afford to grow good food and no matter your income level, you're able to buy that food and we can change the policies together to make that actually happen. So we're building those real systems yeah. 
um, across the board. I think it's food production, it's food waste, and it's also like what more people are aware of so they have a say and a part in it. I, I think the awareness comes from the environment we are in, right? When you say, you know, grandma's knows best, uh, there are certain, mm -hmm. like i give you an example. Years ago I did uh, this campaign, uh, No Child Hungry, I, I think it was called, but mm -hmm. we committed to live uh, for a week with uh, yeah. below the poverty line. Yes. So we had uh, each a dollar and a half budget per day, per meal. Mm -hmm. So we did a week with six dollars for a family of four, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. The only issue, and, and we did it, mm -hmm. the only issue there is that you need to know where to put those dollars. And exactly. that's an exercise that most people do not know. Making, baking bread, it is not that hard. But when you think it the reverse, the right. person that has these issues, you know, being you know, on the poverty line or below the poverty line, it's probably like, you know, single mother, or single father, multiple kids, multiple jobs. There's not much time to bake bread. Right. So it's, it's a catch-22. Uh, I, I think mm -hmm. that this kind of stuff should really be spoken in, in, in school. Like that, that's also mm -hmm. why I approach the, this moment yeah. as, as a cultural moment more than a show just because I, as you see, I like to talk about, you know, stuff. <laughs> but I, I do believe that people yeah. need to kind of like take a breather and, and just yeah. realize, uh, you know, what's happening. Don't you, you know, do you agree? No, I definitely agree. Yeah, we offer, you know, something we try to do with our partners um, throughout the community is connect them to that kind of information. Um, one thing, like in particular, um, a workshop that we do either as an exercise and I take it out to the community or we'll do it longer and, and part of a multi-day um, advocacy training is people power and just people power in local city government and just even giving folks a chance to understand that they have power even on the municipal level Absolutely. and in different ways beyond just voting that they can have a say, they can make be a decision maker. You can be as young as 16 or you can be in senior and run for community boards um, and get involved. You can um, advocate at different levels. And it, it, it's that, it's like getting, sparking folks in action, people who tend to not be um, either seen or heard, um, help, helping them see that they do have a say and a power right. and they do have a voice. And it's not that they don't know what they need to survive, um, but community-driven solutions are possible. Well, ultimately, because especially for uh, the job that you do, there has to be the spark that moves somebody to download your app. Right. So mm -hmm. where do you see the challenge in driving people to your app? Or I don't want to say recruiting, but you know, s spreading the gospel yeah. and making sure that people do understand the value and right. are brought to activate themselves, <laughs> so yeah. to speak. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I, I mean, for us, it's mostly just talking about the problems. The, yeah. the once people, like people don't even think about food or food waste. Uh, people don't think about hunger in the US uh, a lot of times. Um, That's because you don't see it. It's not rubbed yeah, in your I face. Yeah, people think yeah. about it uh, in, in, you know, it's abroad. It's not here. It's, we don't right. have to worry about it. It's not next door. Um, and when we start talking about it, I think, you know, people mm -hmm. immediately start thinking, how can I help? Um, and it's, it's, it, it's, it's really great to see people, like, be more involved in their communities, not just, you know, picking up food from point A and, and dropping it off at point B, but also thinking about, oh, I'm moving, I, I can donate my stuff. And now that they know where the yeah. local homeless shelters and soup kitchens are, they start to get more involved yeah. in the community and, and do more. And I think uh, in, in terms of the challenge of recruiting more volunteers, it's honestly just about telling people about what we do and then spreading the word on like Same. social media. Right. And both your and companies work with yeah. volunteers, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and we rely heavily on volunteers. Without volunteers, the whole thing doesn't work. I, I'm so curious so. about the demographic of your volunteers. You got everybody? Kids, um, mothers, and grandmothers, or there is yeah. a, there's a group that is more active than others? No, you know, I think it depends. Um, our, with our work, we tend to share a lot of our volunteer desire, so when people have um, an interest, with our community partners. Because a lot of times when people reach out to me and they're like, we're just, you know, I want to reach out to Just Food, I want to volunteer, they tend to mean like, I want to get my hands dirty, I want to go to a community garden, I want to be in the ground. And I always tell folks, like, food justice, everyone has, you are a food justice warrior if you want to be one right yeah. now. If you have skills that... I like it, food justice warriors. Oh, yeah. We all are. You can. Are. Yeah. And it doesn't mean that you have to have my job or you have to have a direct food job. There are, you know, other opportunities to play a role in, you know, like Robert's work is really important. Growing food is important. And we have partners that rely on work days and volunteer days to help them do that work because it, it's hard work and it takes 
actual hand, especially at the scale in, in neighborhoods. Um, and for you know, for us too, we've had grandmothers and parents. We've had families volunteer for us at our Just Food conference together. Mm -hmm. um, we had um, a really it's big like almost like a Sunday group. outing, like doing yeah. an activity that is uh, exactly you know, equal to doing good. Oh yeah, you know, social good. Yeah, when it comes to like the office parts, like maybe doing advocacy work or helping us do organizing work, they tend to skew um, in youth, so mm -hmm. like 18 to 22. But I think more and more people are realizing like they need to step up and be active. So they're trying to find ways to be active. And that's why I always tell folks like you can be, even if you feel your skill is not directly food related, it, it, it can actually help a, a, a nonprofit that is connecting food to folks um, or organizing or protesting, and that can really be a part. Website, you know, anything. You'd be surprised the skills that you have that you minimize that, that can actually be leveraged to help oh, that's, a nonprofit. Oh, that, that's incredible. There's always some type of potential in any oh, of yeah. us. It's just a matter of finding the right person that wakes you up and it's like, oh my gosh, like I, mm -hmm. I didn't know. I didn't know this about me. Yeah. Like I, you know, when I created the, the, the first blog that ended up on, on, on TV, I get paid to be a chef. I'm not a chef. This to me excites mm -hmm. me because I am adding my, my ingredients into the context of, of the world where we live in. Yeah. And th that kind of like completing a connection that to me is extremely important. It's not just about the plating. Like I know a lot of people. To, yeah. give, to give another example, high cuisine, okay? Mm -hmm. The... W the dish is really expensive <laughs> because it looks pretty, but because there is a lot of waste attached to that. Right. Manpower, tons of hands that touch your food, different sourcing, expensive ingredients. Uh, it might be exciting. It might be Instagram uh, worthy. Right. It <laughs> might help you drive traffic. It might help you show people that you're eating better than them. Mm. But to me, the soup made by grandma that yep. shopped, peeled, chopped, cooked, and served, everything done by one person, to me that is the smallest footprint and the most honest food that, that you can get. So that's also, yeah. you know, what you see is really not what you get most of the times. And uh, I am in favor personally of cookbooks without pictures. Oh. Imagine in your head, mm. like think about it. Like, yeah. I mean, look, if you're in the kitchen, like you probably have cooked once before. It's right. like, <laughs> you know what looks good or what looks right, bad. Right. Um, that's true. It, it, Something else that I really would like to touch on. Th this is great because we're talking about people that find uh, somebody that wakes them up or find that spark that drives them to, to act mm -hmm. upon it. Sometimes, though, you have issues of your city or yeah. your council members or certain obstacles like you might have had before you know, about mm -hmm. donating food. Is uh, the city helping what you're doing? Uh, do you have support in your... you know? local legislative bodies or do you feel that your work could go faster or move faster or, or or do better if there was more support in fact yeah right now, i mean right now there's a lot of exciting things happening in the food waste um area i think there's um you know a lot of uh you know interest in creating a kind of a uh, directory uh, amongst the city council members uh, I think Reynoso has um, has proposed a, 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 um, a specific thing that would create a tool that would allow for people to find organizations mm -hmm. like us. Especially, you know, we're only five years old, uh, and we are going out there and you know telling people about rescuing La Cuisine, but not many people yet know about us. Um, and you know, a tool like that would also give legitimacy to the fact that you can donate food. And a lot of mm -hmm. restaurants are like, no, no, you, I thought that was you know illegal. Uh, but if you know a set of council members is, is doing that and, and, and a proponent of it, it would be huge. Yeah. Um, and so I think they're doing a, a lot of great work and uh, it really needs to be pushed forward by the people. I think as long as you know the, us citizens uh, show interest in the fact that we want uh, food to be donated and we want food to come from uh, good sources and, and, and mm -hmm. um, I think th the, the representatives would. Is it the same that way that you forward. feel you, you have felt supported in your choices and in, in your work? Um, yes, I think it's like a growing edge. I think there is definitely an interest in local representatives to meet the needs and, and demands of their constituents. 
I think sometimes, um, again, with a racial lens to our the history of, of New York and our communities, there are a lot of people who have not been really heard and their work has been minimized or mm -hmm. marginalized. Um, and, and for us, that's like our work is to help yeah. those partners get amplified and be amplified. And it's, um, it's important work, and I think local elected officials, at least in the work that we've been doing in particular around um, urban agriculture policy and what that could look like in New York City, I think there's been a growing interest from certain representatives to hear from you know, different voices. Mm -hmm. It's just, it, for us, it's making sure that equity is at that table and that all voices are being heard because then all needs will be heard. Um, and that's usually folks that say have been growing or handling their food waste in their community um, for years, generations, and those folks can't be ignored, and yep. their needs can't be ignored. And there's, you know, our neighborhoods are changing rapidly, so there's different ways that we can approach this, and just making sure that any resources or capital um, that are coming from the local or state level are being given in accessible ways, so everyone can use them for their needs. Because what maybe uh, maybe a tech startup need is different than, say, a community gardener. Absolutely. That doesn't mean that those resources shouldn't be allocated equitably. No, absolutely. So, yeah, I think there's an interest. I think what um, Robert was saying, I agree with too, is continuing for community folks to know what's going on and then be able to have a say throughout the full process. Do, do you find there is a synergy between companies like yours? Like, did you guys know each other? I believe we <laughs> had a um, Columbia conference that we were actually sponsored uh, oh. uh, just for the conference, yeah. So we, I mean, we, okay. we yeah. Yeah, do you do you find that you know? I mean, I I, I hope and yeah. I, and, I, and I'm a strong believer that companies like yours, aside mm -hmm. from building a directory that can be accessed to everybody, right? Like, warriors needs to kind of like stick together and figure Definitely. out where the strength mm -hmm. is. Yeah. So I am sure that you know your work can complement his and Absolutely. his, uh, you know, vice versa. So I'm also happy to kind of like to play matchmaking and oh bring, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and bring totally these issues. It. Okay, so we have uh, about three minutes left. I would like to hear from you uh, a, a final thought touching on the title of the show. So f Future Bites. What's in the future if, if you see yourself where you're, where you're now? <laughs> uh, how technology can help you or just in general the, the, the future of your of the work that you do? Yeah, I mean, we actually, there's a lot of exciting things happening uh, in the tech space, specifically in the kind of, um, you know, uh, autom automotive uh, sphere. And so we want to see if we can apply that to the food industry space. Uh, and I, I don't believe anyone's really kind of looking into that right now, but uh, we're writing a white paper on, on, on specifically mm -hmm. um, automated vehicles and how that can apply to food rescue. And so, we want to be on, um, you know, the, the front lines of, of how technology can play into uh, the problems of food waste and, and hunger. And um, I think too far often a lot of nonprofits just wait for, you know, technology to kind of, you know, uh, pan out and then use it and apply it. And I think if we are able to take what's coming up and plan for it and, and, and s insert ourselves into the large companies, you know, Ten of the largest Fortune 500 companies are in this specific field. If we can insert ourselves in and, and tackle the issue of food waste and hunger, it's a solvable problem, um, and you know, make this a more efficient uh, solution. I think it would be huge. So that's, I mean, that's what's super exciting to me. I know it's super, you know, long term, but I think, you know, for now, for the next two to five years, we're also obviously building on our technology, adding new features, um, and expanding across the U.S. Wonderful. So yeah, mm -hmm. totally exactly. agree. So let's remind uh, our viewers and our listeners where they can reach yeah, you about so your website uh, and your yeah, app. It's, it's just rescuingleftovercuisine.org, uh, and people can sign up online. Okay, perfect. Mm -hmm. And you, Kiana? Wow. Um, yeah, you know, just Yeah, very existential <laughs> questions. <laughs> 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 um, you know, I always tell people in terms of justice, you're, we're trying to do work that's essentially putting ourselves out of business. So if I was to look forward, the work that we're doing to make those connections to, you know, um, diverse farmers, diverse community members, building strategic partnerships across cooperative communities, building solidarity economy in the city and within our region, um, building um, stronger 
businesses that support local food, eliminate food waste, that are creating jobs for folks in the community. I think the more, when I see my work, the more we're able to do that and move that forward, and more people are eating, more people are able to have healthy food-based businesses, um, and we're shifting power in food, and there's more folks of color doing this work, there's more folks in um, community, local, level, federal level policies, if when I start to see those real shifts, I think that's where I'll see where my work is and that's where I'm continuing to go. Um, go and girl. Hmm? Go girl. Oh, yes, thank you. absolutely. <laughs> and yeah, I want to see more people see that food can be a tool and food is um, power. Yeah. Um, and food is not just what you eat, it's how you connect to people. Yeah. So I think hopefully we will be over. Yeah, food <laughs> is like, you know, almost like a, a love letter. Yes, exactly. Um, Kiana and Robert, thank you so, so much for being thank part you. of this uh, recording. Uh, one, one final thought. Months ago, I uh, saw this uh, video on Instagram that was about the 24-hour compost garbage can. It's like a $700 <laughs> device, right? <laughs> that us white people can buy and <laughs> put in our white kitchen. <laughs> so you can just toss your leftovers and uh, 24 hours later, you will have compost so you can plant your geranium uh, on, your, uh, on your balcony. Great tech, great idea. But that's not the solution. Compost <laughs> takes longer than 24 hours. Mm -hmm. Learn what compost is. Yes. Do the compost. Do it with your kids. Again, again the change uh, comes uh, because of technology, but also comes with uh, real work and real connection where you come from. Get dirt under your nail, and then use your app to make it all work. But do not think that certain inventions are here to eliminate the problem that right. we have created just by adding another problem because a garbage can that costs $700 <laughs> is by <laughs> default and by definition just a garbage can. Right. So there's a, a lot of things that, you know, I, I work with the, you know, with the Food Bank of New York City mm -hmm. and $1 can generate five meals. Mm -hmm. So when I think about, and it, you know, all, 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 all the gadgets that I want yeah. to buy in life and the difference that $5 can make yeah. uh, in, in some people's life versus uh, do I really need a fourth garbage can in my kitchen right. to tell my white friends I'm doing compost every 24 <laughs> exactly. hours? Um, so yes, that's my <laughs> final thought. Thank you so, ma so much for tuning in with uh, uh, Future Bites. Thank you again, Thank Kiana you. and Robert, for being here. Tell your friends, uh, post it, do, yes. and just go Warriors. You're good. Thank, Thank you. you so much for being here Thank again. You. Thank you. Thank you.